Okay, let's get started. Good evening, I'm Eric Adams, and I'd like to welcome everybody to MIT and to this, our annual Freeman Lecture. Our speaker's on a tight uh, schedule tonight, so I will be very brief. Just want to mention that this uh, lecture, annual lecture, is on behalf of John R. Freeman. He was an MIT graduate. <clears throat> he was became a, a famous hydraulic and water resources engineer towards the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, probably best known around these parts for his role in the uh, design of the original Charles River Dam, where the Science Museum is. <clears throat> when he died, he left some funds to the society, and it's these funds that in large part have helped uh, produce this lecture for the past 40 or so years. Uh, if people have an interest in finding out more about uh, John Freeman or the past lectures, uh, many of which are videotaped, or other uses of the funds, in particular the scholarships that are given out to uh, graduate students and young practicing professionals, uh, please see the BSCE website. <clears throat> so I'd like to introduce now Jeff Schwartz, who's the president-elect of BSCE. And following that, uh, we'll have a brief introduction on, of the speaker by Pete Shanahan and Steve Chopra. But first, George, Jeff, sorry. Uh, thank you, Eric, and uh, thanks to the Freeman Fund um, and Dr. Lantain for allowing me to just speak for a couple of uh, minutes just on behalf of the uh, Boston Society of Civil Engineering. Um, as you know, the uh, society, um, uh, d Dr. Um, sorry, John Freeman, um, as Eric uh, said, he uh, was a very active member in the society, and uh, he um, left um, a uh, very um, handsome uh, donation uh, at the end, um, and he wrote down a, uh, he, he basically created the uh, fund, and um, one of the things he said was that it seems only fair that when one has found lifelong happiness and attained a competence from his profession, he should recognize the debt he owes to those who went before him and whose data he used and should in some way try to help these young engineers in his profession who are following after. So he was uh, paying it um, back and uh, I just encourage everyone to um, uh, appreciate um, this man and uh, just um, from the Boston Society, um, we're a nonprofit organization and we put on uh, approximately 50 events a year and we have um, a young members group, we have eight technical um, committees, um, we also have 10 American Society of Civil Engineers student chapters including at MIT, so I encourage um, the younger folks to um, Please try to get involved if it's uh, just volunteering at an event or attending a couple lectures or signing up um, to uh, join a committee or on the student chapter. And I encourage um, uh, the uh, companies and uh, the, the um, universities to, um, if you can, um, to think about making contributions, um, be it um, volunteering a space for some of our lectures or um, becoming one of our annual society sponsors. And uh, that's all I have. Anyway, I'll turn it over and uh, thanks a lot. I'm, uh, I'm Pete Shanahan, and this is Steve Chapra, and we're both members of the Freeman Committee, and it's our pleasure to introduce Pro Professor Danielle Lantain of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Tufts University to give the 42nd John R. Freeman Memorial Lecture. Uh, I first met Danielle in September 2000 when she became a student in the Master of Engineering program here at MIT. Uh, she was returning to grad school after working a few years and brought with her a, a certain confidence and body of knowledge that, uh, um, from her time in practice. One of the key features of the MEng program was a team project on a real-world real problem 
that gave students practical project experience and which generally formed the basis for their thesis. Uh, I was supervisor of a four student team that was completing a project to assist a nonprofit organization that manufactured and supplied home drinking water treatment systems in Haiti. Danielle was on that team and very quickly emerged as the leader of the team. Although I worked with her and the rest of the team through the fall, it really wasn't until the field trip to Haiti that I got to know the real Danielle. Um, the students had been in Haiti about a week when I arrived and our local contact with a nonprofit group told me about this fearless student who was driving four wheel drive vehicles on treacherous and muddy mountain roads in Haiti and that student, of course, was Danielle. Uh, she was also fearless academically. Uh, she worked with Professor Geschwend and tackled um, a very demanding thesis that was really more of an MS level thesis than an MNG level thesis, a two year thesis rather than a one year thesis. Phil's here tonight and luckily he didn't say, uh, I think you need a little more in chapter three. Um, but that was kind of the story. Um, there's no expectation from the MNG thesis that you will publish your work, but Danielle was one of about maybe two dozen students out of the 800 in total who published her work individually after she uh, finished up. She continued to be fearless in her post-graduation work and traveling the world to investigate outbreaks of waterborne diseases and to troubleshoot drinking water treatment systems. She, um, she also completed her PhD in water safety in emergencies at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Danielle does hard but really important work. We take clean water and sanitation for granted, but in much of the world, children routinely die and grow up stunted due to unsafe water and disease cause that, it, that it causes. Folks like Danielle who work to bring the benefits of sanitation and clean water to those who lack it, do so at great personal inconvenience and risk. We should celebrate and appreciate their fearlessness and the benefit that redounds to our profession from their work. Uh, Danielle continues her work today as a professor at Tufts and Steve is going to talk a little bit about that work. Thanks, Pete. Um, many of you know the fact that environmental engineering was originally sanitary engineering, started in the latter part of the 19th century in London when they built sewers there to uh, clean up the Thames and to take care of things like cholera. Over the years, it's really senesced uh, as uh, public health was, was taken over by medicine, and, and that was the primary people who were dealing with public health. I want to put Danielle in the context of Tufts, because uh, while this was all happening, I guess we were a spore stage. We were, like, we were hibernating at Tufts. Uh, there was a small group of dedicated people who worked in public health, uh, thanks to uh, the late Bruce Haynes, um, who established that at Tufts. Uh, after that, when I came there, uh, David Goot, um, who was the leader of the group, and is to this day and the architect of where they're going into the future, uh, had a, two or three people really around him. They did great work, but they didn't have the critical mass. So over the past 10 years, I've watched uh, uh, him build, build the intellectual infrastructure to have a critical mass of people working in the area. Um, and in the process of doing that, he's made some fantastic hires. I mean, I think every person we've hired has been a real ace. Uh, it'll be good for us to retire. There'll be these young ones coming up. And the first one was Danielle. Um, and uh, the, the thing that Danielle's unique in many, many ways, including the driving, uh, but no, but she's the prototype of what David, I know his vision, and I share that vision of what the, the, the health engineering, inf uh, environmental health engineer of the future will be uh, like. Now, I have not read from a thing, a piece of paper in the last 40 years. And I told you I wasn't gonna do it, but I wrote this so beautifully that I, I, I'm afraid I would stumble over it. And when you read things like this, it doesn't sound like it's coming from the heart, right? It's like I'm doing a teleprompter. But you know this comes from the heart. OK. There are a lot of individuals who are passionate about humanity and its health. For most, their passion might be expressed uh, politically or financially. Uh, but Danielle is unique in combining an almost spiritual zeal uh, with the engineering and public health science chops 
uh, to actually do something about it. Uh, plus, and I'm glad I included this, she's utterly fearless in terms of going places that most of us would really feel very uncomfortable going to. She goes right into the teeth of, of these places and does real hands-on work. So it's a great honor and blessing uh, in the last years of my career to work with an in, uh, individual of Danielle's intellect, character, talent, and heart. And so I'd like to introduce the uh, 2018 Freeman Lecturer, Danielle Lentan. Can everybody here is the mic? That's great. OK. I wanted to say thank you for that. It's amazing to be here. I came to MIT as an undergrad. I add up the years. It's incredible. It's, it's like 26 years ago. And then as a grad student, it was 18 years ago. It's, it's amazing how fast time flies. And it's an honor to be here today to give this lecture, to have those amazing introductions of everybody. So what I'll talk about today is uh, what has formed the body of my research over about the past decade, which is water, sanitation, hygiene, and engineering and international humanitarian response with some um, lessons from Haiti and other countries. So the outline of the presentation, I'm going to start with an introduction to WASH and health and then move forward into an introduction to humanitarian response and then merge these together. Um, then I'll talk about how in the past few years, the, the paradigm has really changed. Our emergencies are changing. Where humans are living are changing. Climate change is moving on. And give examples of how now in, in Haiti, Kenya, and Syria, we're working to provide water supply treatment, sanitation, and water supply in conflict-affected zones in areas where it's not yet possible or to have infrastructure or where infrastructure has been deliberately dismantled because of conflict. Right? And then I'll end with a little bit on engineering and humanitarian response and education. So starting with the introduction to health and wash, right? Over the past 28 years, we've done amazing at reducing under five mortality worldwide. Generally, children have morbidity and mortality, death and disease from unsafe water and sanitation. Right? And we've actually reduced the rates of under five mortality, infant mortality, which is under one mortality, and neonatal mortality, under 28-day mortality, by more than half. To give some numbers to that, um, it was about 12.6 million under fives died each year in 1990. That's down to 5.6. And it was about 35,000 a day in 1990, and it's 15,000 a day in 2016. So we're really seeing a large-scale reduction in death, and those large trends are fantastic, right? But what is actually causing those deaths in under fives now? The vast majority of the piece of the pie now, in 2016, that's the latest data, is neonatal causes. Children who die in the first 28 days because of um, something going wrong in the, in the pregnancy, in the childbirth, um, sepsis introduced in labor, or infections that come in the first couple weeks of life. Um, to follow on, those congenital um, defects and those birth issues also cause 7% of under five death, but after those first 28 days. So over half of the death is from something that went wrong in the pregnancy, the birth, or the, um, or the kind of right after, um, right at the beginning of life. After that, you have pneumonia, mostly caused by unsafe cook stoves, indoor air pollution, or outdoor air pollution in some of the countries, China, India, and Asia, right? And then diarrhea, mostly from unsafe water and unsafe sanitation. Malaria, which is mosquito-borne, right? And then a mix of meningitis, um, AIDS, and measles, right? Measles, the first fully vaccine-preventable disease here. And then injuries and others. And what I want to highlight in this, in this pie is this is not you don't need fancy engineering or big technical whiz-bangs to reduce this death. We need adequate prenatal care. We need safe birthing kits. We need water and sanitation. We need sleeping under bed nets and, and vector control. We need safe cook stoves and, and air pollution. These are the same things that we went through in this country 100 years ago. My, my grandmother had 10 children in rural Wisconsin during the Great Depression. Five died before the age of five, right? That's two generations ago for me. And so this is where we are now with children worldwide, but it's getting better quickly, right? 
So to come straight to, to kind of drill down to diarrhea, this is a picture of my son. He's six months old. He's with me on a trip in Sierra Leone. We boiled water and we cooled it to give him a bath. What do you notice about him? You don't have to be polite. Yes, he's healthy, but we, exactly, we say he's healthy, but why do we say he's healthy? Because he's, he's fat. <laughs> he's not, he's fat, right? My pediatrician called him a rubber band baby because you see the rubber bands. But when we see a baby like this, we say they're healthy because they're fat and they're chunky. And we want to, my daughter was also, had big cheeks, and they say, oh, I want to eat your cheeks. And I'm like, don't eat my daughter's cheeks. <laughs> Right? But children die of diarrhea because they have an immature immune system and they don't have this physiological reserve. We say they're healthy because if they get diarrhea and they lose a pound, they'll survive. Right? They have multiple physiological insults. They may be malnourished, protein caloric deficient, micronutrient deficient. They have frequent infections. It could be diarrhea now, acute respiratory infection next week, malaria the week after. They live in a feces contaminated environment and limited access to effective clinical care. Right? And so about 50% of that pie chart of, of child death comes from malnourishment. You don't have enough of the chunk to keep living. And this is an image from a, a child in a diarrhea hospital in Bangladesh. And you could see that she's at the other end of the spectrum from my son. Right? So what is safe drinking water? And what are we trying to provide? Um, the Sustainable Development Goals, which were set in 2015 by the UN and go to 2030 and 2040, replaced the MDGs, which were um, worldwide goals to eradicate poverty that lasted from 2000 to 2015. And the goal now for water is universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water. And the goal for everyone is to have what we're used to here, which is safely managed. And safely managed means drinking water from an improved water source, which is located on premises, available when needed, and free from fecal contamination. Right, so you turn on the tap and you get safe water. Now we talk about a drinking water ladder, where at the bottom of the ladder is people collecting surface water and bringing it home. Or collecting from an unimproved source, like an open well. Or collecting from an improved source, like a protected well with a pump, but from more than 30 minutes away, so they're walking and taking the burden of walking or basic, which is an improved source, like a protected well, but within 30 minutes of your home so the burden of walking isn't too great. And we talk now about trying to move everyone up the ladder. Right now, there's about 800 million people in here, about 2 billion people in here, right? So we're talking about a large problem. We have equivalent ladders for sanitation and hygiene, moving from open defecation to safely managed and treated um, sanitation and hand washing from no facility to having a facility to wash your hands with soap and water. Right? And one thing I really want to highlight here is safe drinking water is water that's safe to drink in the user's cup. When we go to households, we ask the question, can you please provide me a cup of water as you would give to a child in this household right now? And we test that water. This is an example of water from Ethiopia. This is a, a woman who had access to earth pan water. It was an open source. They dug out clay soil, so they let the rainwater fill it. And this is the water in her household. So, OK. So to come a little bit to what causes diarrhea, diarrhea is actually caused by about 32 different organisms, right? some bacteria, some viruses, some protozoa. And in general, the bacteria are um, free, uh, free living organisms, um, single celled. They can replicate in the environment and they have a cell wall. Now that cell wall is a lipid membrane, so chlorine can interfere with that cell wall and lyse the cell. So chlorine will kill the bacteria. Um, they're also about one micron, one millionth of a meter in size. And so they can also be filtered um, through um, sand or ceramic, sometimes cloth, etc. Some bacteria that cause diarrhea you might have heard of, cholera, typhoid. Right? And the next class of organisms is, is protozoa. So protozoa are bigger. This is a picture of Giardia swimming in your intestine. Right? Giardia, they're about 3 to 10 microns in size, so they're easily filterable. But when they exit their body, they're triggered. Right? And so they encase themselves in a cyst or a shell. That shell or cyst is incredibly environmentally resistant. Cryptosporidium can overwinter in frozen streams in Massachusetts and be infectious come spring. It's incredibly resistant to chlorination. And so these are mostly we rely on filtration to reach our protozoa. 
Lastly is viruses, free floating strands of DNA or RNA, quite small, not filterable with normal filters. You need higher tech filters. But they are generally inactivated by chlorine because chlorine breaks the DNA and RNA strands. Some viruses you may have heard of, rotavirus, norovirus. So when we talk about removing these three pathogen classes, we talk about combined filtration and chlorination to reach all pathogens. And this is what we did during the sanitary revolution in the United States from about 1870 to 1930, is we provided drinking water that was filtered and chlorinated to our cities, and we massively reduced the epidemic disease burden. So this is an example from Philadelphia. In the late industrial revolution, you see typhoid cases going up. This is a log scale of typhoid cases. Typhoid cases going up to 10,000 per year. You see a 90% reduction, a one log reduction when you have filtration of the water system, and a second log reduction to 99% reduction with chlorination in 1913. This type of graph is echoed across the US and Europe throughout the sanitary revolution in that kind of early 1900s period. We used to have diseases of cholera, typhoid, gastroenteritis in our cities, and we don't have those anymore. Right. So we solved. Um, kind of the US water problem with infrastructure, large scale infrastructure, water treatment, wastewater treatment. And so why not do this in all contexts, right? There's huge advantages to infrastructure. You provide reliable quality water. You have disease reduction from the water, but you also have better hygiene. If you have water coming out of the tap, you wash your house, your child, your kitchen, your plates, right? And so you have much better hygiene as well. But infrastructure requires political stability, a large investment of public dollars. Our waste here, when we flush the toilet, goes to Deer Island Wastewater Treatment Plant, approximately $4 billion to build for 4 million people, give or take 200 to 300 million a year to operate, right? So you're talking about that comes through user fees, through government grants, through loans, and you have a, you must have, in order to fund that, you need to have a banking system that works, a system to bill users to collect those fees. You also need to have a, t a terrain that's conducive. It can't be too hilly. You don't want to pipe water up the mountain. And a population density. I grew up in rural Washington state. We were on a private well and a, and a septic tank because it didn't make sense to bring the pipes to our home. About 10% of the US is not on centralized treated water. They have private systems. Additionally, and I think this comes into what's happening now is, as the world is changing a bit in the last few years, we're seeing that Population stability is necessary for infrastructure. If you have people moving because they don't have secure land tenure in a slum, or if they're moving because of an emergency, putting an in infrastructure, I talked to someone from, who was working in Yemen. Um, they had been responding in Yemen. They put in infrastructure to reach a population. But because of the conflict, that population moved. So the time it was installed, it wasn't needed. Right? And so infrastructure is hard systems. And if you have insecure land tenure or, or um, lack of population stability, it's, it's not appropriate. So what do we do when we can't put in infrastructure yet? And generally, we talk about infrastructure being this sense of uh, that we have, I'm sorry, we have two narratives, right? We have right now in the world. And what we say is for Urban high income contexts, we look at having infrastructure, water coming into our homes, wastewater treatment, and these kind of fat, healthy children. And then we talk about rural low income water, where you don't have the benefits of this, and you're collecting water from these earth pans, right? this kind of water source, like we saw in the cup earlier, and storing water in unsafe containers, and then having children that are sick and not surviving. And so what we've been talking about doing for these rural contexts for about the past 20 or 30 years, since about 1980, is four interventions. Water supply provision, right? Giving people a protected well. Water treatment, this is a picture in Haiti of a woman using a bottle of chlorine to treat water in a bucket. Isolation of feces from the environment in a latrine, or hand washing. And all four of these have been shown to reduce the burden of diarrheal disease in people without infrastructure in rural low-income contexts. Right? And so that's what we've been talking about. That's kind of been the narrative for the past 30 or so years of development work. 
And we talk about when we do these in order to make sus programs sustainable, we need technologically verified solutions that are cost effective and that there's a population who demands them and uses them. So we talk about behavior change at the individual level to have these actions being completed and that leads to sustainable programs, right? Okay, so I want you to take that and leave that for a bit and I'm gonna come at it from a totally different side, right? So I'm gonna talk about humanitarian response as opposed to development work and then I'm gonna merge them. So humanitarian response started with a memoir called A Memory of Solferino. It was a person, Henry Dunant, who was on a battlefield in Italy, and after the battle was over, he noticed the soldiers from both sides dying of their wounds untreated on the battlefield. He decided he wanted to ameliorate this, and he formed in 1863 the predecessor of the International Committee for Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. In 1864, the first Geneva Convention was, was signed by 12 governments, and it was the amelioration of the condition of the wounded in armies, and it allowed the Red Cross to go in and treat soldiers on both sides of the conflict after the battle was over. Right? The ICRC principles, which remain to this day, are humanity, you reach out to try and help people, you are impartial, you treat people on both sides, you are neutral, you do not take a side in the conflict, and you are independent, you are able to make those decisions for yourself and respond. So as we continue with humanitarian response, ICRC was crucial in establishing international law after World War I and II, naming the NGO a non-governmental organization in the UN Charter, which means non-government, non-state actors were considered able to be part of the UN, and in responding during the Cold War, because during the Cold War, it wasn't like you could fly to any country. It wasn't like the US citizens could respond in a Soviet-controlled country. And so ICRC was able to do both, right? At the end of the Cold War, we had a peace dividend, and that peace dividend meant there was much more ability for humanitarian response to happen. So now suddenly, there's a humanitarian emergency in Angola, and anyone can respond. It's not just those associated with the Soviet Union, it's both sides. And so we see an incredibly um, growing non-governmental organization, humanitarian response sector, starting around 1980, 1985. So one thing to remember about humanitarian response is really it's only about 40 years old as we know it. So then people started responding and then we started to get accountability after the Rwanda genocide. The Rwanda genocide happened in 1994. About 800,000 people were killed in 100 days. This led to mass migration, the largest mass migration, the fastest in history. About two million people from Rwanda crossed over into the DRC, also an area affected by conflict. And aid really messed up. Um, essentially, aid was given to people in refugee camps, but that aid was diverted to continue the war, right? The armies took over the refugee camps. And there was about 50,000 people who died in one month because there was a cholera outbreak that was poorly treated. They didn't do adequate cholera treatment. Right? And this led to kind of a sea change in humanitarian response. It led to a sense that we need to be accountable in how we do humanitarian response. And so ICRC, as a leader, plus other NGOs, gathered to establish a code of conduct. Some minimum standards called the sphere standards were established. These are minimum standards and key indicators. If you treat cholera, you should rehydrate first, then do IV solution, then do antibiotics. If you're providing water, you should provide 15 liters per person per day as a minimum amount of water. These are minimum standards that are agreed to by the community. And they established out of this a cluster system, which is maintained to this day. So the cluster system is managed by a humanitarian and emergency relief coordinator. This is when the UN announces that there's an emergency. Haiti earthquake happens, right? Within a day, the UN says this is an emergency. We're establishing an emergency coordinator. And then there are nine Actually, are there more now? There are more now. I'm sorry. When it started, there were nine. Now there's 11 clusters. One of those clusters is water, sanitation, and hygiene. The goal of the clusters is to coordinate response, to have meetings, to share information, to have a strategic response, and to coalesce around funding goals and gain that funding and distribute it. So this is some management around humanitarian response. Um, 
So to think about what type of emergencies we're working with, right? There's natural disasters, earthquakes, eruptions, landslides, et cetera. We generally see epidemics after either flooding events or mass displacement. And natural disasters are increasing, both in their intensity and number because of climate change, and in their impact because we have more population, right? We see outbreaks. Um, we've been rocked by three outbreaks worldwide how, er, in the US lately, Haiti, cholera, Ebola, Zika, right? Outbreaks are increasing, particularly in Africa. And then we have complex emergencies in fragile states. And this is essentially conflict areas where the government may not support the people, where your government is not protecting you. And these complex emergencies are increasing right now, particularly in the Middle East. So right now, we're in a time where emergencies are increasing in both number and intensity and the number of people affected, right? When we talk about people affected in emergencies, we talk about refugees. So refugees are people who have fled from their home because of something that has happened, and they have stepped over an international border. They then become a refugee. They're formally protected by international law. And we know when you're managing refugees and they come into camps, you provide five things very quickly, food, water, vaccination, particularly for measles, healthcare and health information. And then this will reduce the crude mortality rate, the CMR, back to normal. Another population impacted by emergencies is IDPs. So these are people not formally protected by international law because they've left their home due to conflict or an emergency, but they haven't crossed a border. They're still within their country. So after Hurricane Katrina, people that went from New Orleans and they moved to Atlanta would have been IDPs. And with generally with, the, with IDPs, we see high crude mortality rates due to an increase in the background diseases that were already there. And then lastly, we have entrapped populations. Um, right now in Yemen, there are some populations we know nothing about because they're behind the conflict lines, DRC. We have entrapped populations that we don't know what the health needs are. Just to give some examples of some conflicts and some health needs and how health needs might be different in different types of emergencies. This is a picture of South Sudan. One of the highest causes of death for all ages in South Sudan, including children, is violence because of the war. Right? This is Kosovo. And in Kosovo, we saw much higher death because of an increase in background diseases, which were diabetes and heart disease. People couldn't get their essential medicines. right? And this is the Haiti earthquake, where we saw an increase in disease, or we saw an increase in death like immediately after the earthquake because of trauma. But after that, the death went back fairly quickly to normal rates, right? So one thing I want to highlight is there tends to be a lot of alarmism after emergencies. We hear, we hear these quotes like, this is a quote from actually someone associated with World Health after the tsunami. Unless the necessary funds are urgently mobilized and coordinated in the field, we could see as many fatalities from diseases as we have seen from the actual disaster itself. Actually, the tsunami, it came in, it caused incredible damage, incredible death, but the water receded, and we didn't see any increase in disease afterward because you either made it through the tsunami or you didn't, right? And another quote that I really like um, is that another common myth about disasters is the effect of local population is helplessly waiting for the Western world to save it. Often when a disaster happens, it's immediately afterward. What happens 24 hours? Who are you digging out after the earthquake? What's happening? The people on the ground are doing that immediate response that saves the lives, right? And how do we support that? Right. So I've, I've given a strand of, of what we do with kind of water and sanitation to prevent disease and death and then how humanitarian response works. And to pull those together, what's important is that the interventions we do in emergency response have tended to be the same interventions we do in development to reduce the disease burden, although slightly different. We still do water supply, but sometimes we do water trucking or, or a movement of water. We do water treatment with chlorine tablets, with other types of water treatment so people can treat their own water. We, work at, we talk about isolating feces in the environment and we talk about hand washing. And interestingly, while we know quite a bit about how these, in, how these interventions work in the development context, we don't know as much about how they work in the emergency context. We kind of transfer them over. And we did a systematic review of the evidence in emergencies. We actually, a student of mine, Travis Yates, 
reviewed 15,000 documents, half from peer-reviewed literature, half from gray literature, and um, found that the evidence base is thin. We know a lot up here. This is where we have a moderate, amount, a moderate quality of evidence. It's mostly quantitative. We know a lot about water treatment, the things where it's really easy to measure. You can measure free chlorine residual. You can measure something. We know a lot about water treatment, but we don't know a lot about hygiene and sanitation. And there's a number of interventions that are only done in emergencies, like water trucking or, or household spraying if you have a cholera outbreak, that we have almost no evidence for how they work because they're not done in the development context, so they're not evaluated. Right? And so there's, there's kind of a gap in what is done and what we know. And then in addition to that gap, the world is changing very fast under us right now. And I think the two things that are coming up very strongly are the increase, the greatest increases in human population right now are populations moving into slums, right? This is where the world is migrating to. The problem is rapidly not becoming a problem of getting water to someone in a rural area out in the middle of nowhere. It's getting water to people living in very dense urban settlements. So this is a map of Africa. Here's the major cities of Africa. The orange is the percent of people in cities that live in slums. You see Nigeria. 70%, you see D, uh, DRC, 75%. You see Ethiopia coming on 80%. This is the fastest growing segment of the human population, and you literally can't put a latrine in this population because you don't have space and you don't have land tenure to put infrastructure in, right? Additionally, our emergencies are changing. Right now, these are the six emergencies where the cluster system has been activated by the Office of Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs. And you see right now we are in conflict. Right? These are, these are large-scale emergencies based in conflict where we have very little access to get to those emergencies. We, don't, we can't go in and build a well because you can't go in. right? And we're also, famine had all but been eradicated in the human population as of about 10 years ago, and we're seeing famine back in Ethiopia, Northeast Nigeria, Somalia, South Sudan, and Yemen, right? And so we're seeing conflict, particularly in Yemen, we're seeing famine plus a cholera outbreak plus conflict plus entrapped populations. And how do you respond in that context, right? And so I want to give some examples from some different contexts about things that how this is evolving and what can be done, right? Because a lot of stuff is being done that's quite good. So from Haiti, we look at water supply and treatment. And generally, ideally, everyone would have access to centralized water treatment, right? You would turn on the tap and the water would come out clean. But if you can't have centralized, then you want point of collection. Maybe it's clean at the well that you walk to. And if you can't have that, then you want point of use where you treat it at the household level. You need more behavior change the lower down on the chain you are. So this is actually one of the projects that we studied in Haiti, where evidently my driving. <laughs> um, this is a, a bucket um, with a lid and a tap, so safe storage container, chlorine solution, right? Branded Guardian Low. This is a project that had been in Haiti, right, since about give or take, 2000, 2001, right? What was interesting about this is when the earthquake hit, a PhD student working in the group, Michael Ritter, was running these projects. He was in Haiti working at the NGO, and he had all the materials in Creole, all the educational materials, all the community health worker training materials. And what he found is he distributed to about 20,000 earthquake-affected families these systems as an emergency response activity, and three quarters of them during the first year after the earthquake were using the chlorine to treat their water as measured by free chlorine residual. Right? This is an amazing result. Right? Five years later, half of them still are. And the reason this program is so successful is it has the community health workers, the local education, the knowledge in Creole. This is the sense of how do you do long-term behavior change at the household use? It's interacting with the community. right? We've, another way to have chlorine in water is to have a tank of chlorine next to a well. So this is a picture from Senegal. It's a woman collecting um, a water from a well and then adding chlorine to it. So it's more point of collection treatment. And interestingly, this didn't work as well in Haiti. 
um, you don't need to see everything on the graph, but you want the bars to be high. This would be reported use of the, of the dispenser, confirmed use, and effective use, microbiological improvement. And you see down here in Haiti and Sierra Leone, the project didn't work very well. It was installed in places that didn't have centralized water sources. They didn't work with a local partner to give education to people. People had rumors about what it was. It broke, right? But here in Senegal, it worked incredibly well. They worked with a local uh, they worked with a local um, kind of Ministry of Health to provide the messages. They worked with a local NGO to work with the partners. They made high quality chlorine and they distributed it through these systems. And you had almost 90% use. So something that comes back to water is there's no one solution. There's no one thing that will work everywhere, but there are solutions that are appropriate for context, right? And this is point of collection. To talk about centralized now, something we're seeing coming more and more in low-income, slum, and emergency context is the private sector. So this is a kiosk. It's just a little kiosk. You walk up to it, it has a tank of water, you buy a bucket, right? And so these water kiosks are commercial sector. They're centrally treated. The water is delivered by truck into this container. And then you purchase by container, right? This is something I didn't see 10 years ago. And actually, in Haiti, CDC did a study. They literally walked this, every street in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. They found 1,300 of these. Half had been opened in the last year. This is a private sector solution. But when they found out, when they asked where the water came from, it actually came back to four large providers. These were franchisers of four large water treatment units. Interestingly enough, because many people had been concerned about the quality of water from this, 91% of the water bought from these stations met World Health E. coli standards, right? And so this is actually really clean water being distributed, which was surprising. And we talked with CDC and the government of Haiti about how the government could do this, and it's about regulating. It's about going to these uh, large providers and making sure the water treatment was working. It's about making sure that the containers that came to here were clean so the water wasn't recontaminated. But there's a private sector providing the water supply. It's mostly clean, and it's about point interventions to ensure the cleanliness that the government or responders could do. Right? Wanted to give some examples from Kenya on sanitation. So traditionally, we've talked about latrines, isolating feces from the environment, right? But we need to move beyond that to thinking about collection, treatment, and reuse, right? Reusing the products. And so this is an example from Sanergy, and this is a program that's done in Kenyan slums, where you have um, Little kiosks, you can go to defecate. You may have a card where you have 20 punches, and every time you need to dedicate, defecate, you go into these fresh life kiosks. They're bucket systems, so you have a hand washing station, you have bucket collection, and then those buckets are collected, and they're collected and then centrally treated, and then you have energy and, um, and compost right coming out of it. So this is the value chain for sanitation. Right? I will say of this program, I'm presenting Sanergy. I have not worked with Sanergy directly, so I'm just presenting their model. Now, another model, Sanovation, who I have worked with, works particularly in refugee camps, and they do a toilet in the home. They give you a toilet. It's a bucket toilet. They come and collect the bucket on, um, every week. They treat it using solar, um, uh, solar treatment in the refugee camp, and they reuse as affordable fuel and they sell that fuel back to the refugees. They have the best fundraiser ever. At Christmas, you can buy these briquettes in a little stocking and give people a stocking full of shit. <laughs> My mother did not appreciate it, <laughs> right? But this is kind of thinking about what it would take to reuse your waste as energy, right? My last example of kind of where we're moving to is Syria and about water supply and conflict. This work has been done in collaboration with UNICEF and a PhD student, Mustafa Sukur, working in the group. Um, Pre-conflict Syria looked like the US or Europe. Our numbers are very good. Access to safe drinking water is 92%. Sanitation is very high. The population in extreme poverty is roughly similar to that which we see in the United States, right? Universal primary education. The conflict begins roughly um, seven years ago, in March 2001, and these numbers have changed drastically in seven years. 13.6 million need assistance, 6 million internally displaced, 70% under the poverty lane, 2 million in shelter, two-thirds with no consistent wash access. It is amazing 
how fast human infrastructure systems degrade in conflict, right? So UNICEF runs the whole of Syria wash cluster to respond and try and think about providing wash surfaces, services, but access is severely restricted. And so there was surveys done down here in South Syria in a population of about a million people in two governorates, 17 subdistricts. And this is what, when I'm talking with people in Yemen, they're using WhatsApp. Here they were using Skype. They were training surveyors across the border using Skype, right, on mobile phones to complete the surveys, do water quality testing, and that data is sent back via the mobile phones to, um, to Jordan, to Amman, Jordan. And then it's a partnership between the local analysis and publication. And so we were working in that area. What we found is, remember how greater than 90% had access to network water, right? By 2016, 77% are using trucked water as their main source. That increases by 2017. Access to network water is now 15%, right? Because it's not been maintained or it's been deliberately targeted. That varies by um, district or sub-district because it depends on which side of the conflict you are on. The government Subdistricts tended to have a little bit more um, infrastructure water. The rebel-held districts tended to have a lot more water trucking because their infrastructure was deliberately targeted. Right? So we see this incredible reduction in access to network water. And the question is, what do you do in this situation? And using the data analysis, doing the regressions, um, there were actually three points that were really seen where you could intervene. You can support the private sector by working with the truckers to get chlorine into those trucks, right? And to give cash to vulnerable populations so they could buy the trucked water. Most people could afford the trucked water, but not everybody could. You can support infrastructure by paying those operators, by helping rebuild, repair, and maintain, and getting chlorine into the system. Chlorine is, is in Syria a weapon of war, and so UNICEF is able to import it and get it to the right people to treat the water. And then for when your private sector isn't working, when your trucks aren't working, and when your infrastructure isn't working, you can do household water treatment. You can hand out tablets to people for when they don't have chlorine. And this is a risk management approach. Like your system is changing under your feet. How do you make sure at all points there's chlorine in that system so that you can reduce the disease? What are your entry points and where do you give cash so that people can access sufficient water? This is a very different type of response, but this is what's being done in Syria and Yemen. These collaborations, local partners across the border, WhatsApp, Skype, cell phones, mobile, data coming across the border, being analyzed, being written up. That's kind of where we're looking at some of these conflict areas. So I wanted to end and just talk a tiny bit about engineering and humanitarian emergencies. Um, what I say about engineering is Engineering is 1% of the problem. Like in these contexts, 99% of the problem is behavior change and access and, and logistics and supply chains. But if you don't have that 1% of the right, you've got nothing. You have to get the engineering right in order to solve the rest of the problem, right? And so I think this work is incredibly interdisciplinary. It's incredibly partnership. You're working across everything. And I think in particular with humanitarian response and in development work in general, this is an amazing way to engage students in kind of one of many future directions for civil and environmental engineering. And we see particularly this is engaging for women and minorities. We see a lot of interest from some of the populations that have traditionally been more excluded from engineering coming into this very tangible way to help, right? I will say this is work that is like, I think about it with the students of how you address it. This is, you can't send an undergraduate to Syria, right? It's, you need to think about how to manage the, the, um, the kind of balance of safety and risk and emotional risk and, and think about what can be done. But I do think when you think about development or humanitarian response, there's a way to kind of engage students and teach them about engineering in a very kind of tangible way that is a, is a, it's, it's a, it's a good driver for, um, for learning, right? And so the last, um, I have two slides. This is my research group. And in particular, I want to call out Travis Yates completed the systematic reviews. Mustafa is working on the work I presented on Syria. 
Um, clearly, in the acknowledgments, affected populations, our response partners, some of whom we can name, some we can't, UN agencies, our collaborators, the research group. And um, I'll end with this um, quote, which is the notion that being humanitarian and doing good are somehow inevitably the same as a hard one to shake off. And I think that engineering in particular can help our humanitarian work to bring it closer to doing good more often. Because if we get that 1% right, if we get that engineering right, we can really help within the greater picture of interdisciplinary work to improve the health of populations. So I wanted to say thank you so much for having me here. And um, I'm happy to take questions. The last thing I want to deeply apologize about this, but someone booked me without my knowledge for a presentation in Berlin from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. tomorrow. <laughs> um, I have a flight at 9.40. I am checked in. <laughs> and I have an amazing person. Who, I, my mother has an expression, AIS time, which is ass in seat time. So my AIS time to be in Pete's car is 8.30. So I want to deeply apologize that I cannot stay until 9. But I am happy to take questions until 8.30. And I deeply, I was supposed to fly to Berlin tomorrow night. But someone assumed, because I was going to be there Thursday, Friday, I'd also be there Wednesday. And I'm like, uh-uh. But it happened. And so I'm happy to take questions for the next about 25 to 30 minutes until the AIS time hits. Thank you so much. OK. And I'm supposed to say, I think that peep, there's like microphones here, and I'm supposed to repeat the questions after you say them. So I don't actually care if you use the microphones. I can repeat your questions where you don't have to move either. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. So you had mentioned a little bit ago about those buckets in Haiti after the earthquake. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and how the usage was going down over a few years. Yeah. Was staying pretty consistent. Yeah. Do you know anything about the data after 2014? We Did it kind of stabilized or? We actually, that's a really, so the question is going back to this uh, graph in Haiti about with the buckets and the chlorine. Do we know anything about the data over 2014? I don't have that data to hand. The person who ran that program is Michael Ritter, who is um, right there. And um, he's now with the PhD group. He's, he's kept analyzing that data. From his numbers, we haven't done this formal of analysis of it, but I think it's roughly stabilized around 40 to 50%. And I had another quick follow-up. Mm -hmm. so, um, with respect to like 20-ish percent or 25 percent, I guess, that was lost, yeah. I think that that is primarily like a psychological thing of post-disaster post after everything is good, people Wait. aren't afraid of their water anymore, or do exactly. they get more funding? What we see over and over again in emergency response is people use what they knew before in the emergency. So if I said, do you know a Brita filter, many of you would say, yeah, I know a Brita filter. And then an emergency happens, and I hand you a Brita filter and say, this will help your water. You have familiarity with that, and you're willing to use it for the time after the emergency. But if I hand you a filter you've never heard of before, you're like, what's this? I'm confused. My family's in chaos. I can't learn something new. So one of the things we find with these existing programs that are in the development context is it really lends itself to when the emergency happens, people feel it increased risk. They have this really high use. After the earthquake, there was the cholera outbreak. There was political violence. There were hurricanes. And we saw this high, high use for a year or two years. Then as your risk perception comes down, it becomes mundane to do it every day. right? It's, it's, do you floss your teeth every day? Like I don't actually want to know the answer to that question. but. Um, <laughs> But that sense of, do you floss your teeth every day? But then if your risk perception goes up, like you might be going to the dentist next week, you floss your teeth every day, right? And so we see these development projects, exactly as you say, they kind of having something there stably that can be used in emergency when the risk perception goes up and then kind of wave along is a really useful way. It's, it's one of the benefits of these development projects that we don't often talk about, is how rapidly they can be scaled up and how rapidly they're accepted by the population in an emergency. Exactly. OK, thank you. Yes? Hi, I was curious about the engineering you're doing for some of these yeah. places. What kinds of, are you deciding the size of buckets? Are you figuring out the dosage? <laughs> exactly. No, this is a really good question, actually. So the question is, what is the engineering we do? I divide up the engineering we do in the group into lab work into field work and into our policy work. So in our lab work, we're doing things like taking a filter or taking a new product that a company wants to design, and we're running E. coli or Vibrio cholera through it, and we're looking at how efficacious it is in the lab to reduce the disease. 
Karine Galanda is here in the back, and she's really doing a lot of work with cholera on surfaces. In cholera outbreaks, we go into households with cholera and we spray the walls with chlorine. Is that useful? So Karine is taking surface discs, wood, dirt, concrete, foam, putting cholera on them and spraying them to see if that actually reduces the cholera burden, right? So we do a lot of stuff in the lab with efficacy of filters, of recommendations. We've done work on Ebola right, with circuits. We don't use the Ebola itself. But in order to look at surface cleaning, we've done hand washing efficacy. We put surrogates on people's hands. We have them wash their hands with different things. And we see how much is removed, right? So that's our lab work. Now our field work, we're going into people's homes and we're seeing how they use something. When you give it to a person, all bets are off. Right? So we give it to a person, we follow up over time. What happens, how does the organization actually implement it? What's the chlorine concentration that's actually handed out? What's the correct dosage for the water, like you say? If you follow up three months, six months, 12 months after they give it, what does that mean? Like, is it working? Is it not working? Do people hate it? Do people love it because it's pretty? Do people, what do people say about it? So it's a lot of the like, once you have an efficacious product, when the rubber meets the road, what goes wrong? When you put the filter out in the house, does the rats eat the tubing? Because the filter's not going to work when the rats eat the tubing, and you've got to fix the tubing, right? And then we also do policy work where we're talking about how to take these results and translate them into, um, into meaningful results for governments. So Anna, who is here, oh, I'm sorry about that. Part of her work was looking at, um, with the Haitian government, there were about 13 products that after the earthquake and cholera, they were household water treatment products, and the companies wanted to sell them in Haiti. And they gave all this information to the government to say, allow us to sell this product in Haiti. One of those products was a pesticide in a bottle that wasn't safe for human consumption. Other of those products didn't actually work, right? And so what Anna did was, it's really hard to sift through like these technical information because the companies are providing deliberately false information. They're, they're providing information in English on an English website. She went through and dug through all this information, a standard four-page fact sheet that a government official in Haiti could read, translate it into French to say, we recommend you approve this product or not. Don't let the pesticide be sold for water treatment in Haiti, even though there's a company that wants to do that to make the money off the Haitian population. Right? And so we look at this lab work, this field work, and this policy work. And one of the things I find is there's amazing engineering behind the simplest things. We, um, we look at ceramic filters with silver. Um, Justine is here. She must be. Yes, she's right there. Looking at, at ceramic filters with silver in them. And the silver prevents bacterial growth within the ceramic filters and gives a little bit of residual to prevent bacterial growth. So it's a little bit of a bacteria side as well. And the ceramic filter is a, a pore size exclusion filter. Well, the department head, Dr. Kurt Pinnell, at Tufts works on nanoparticles. So his students have got into the nanoparticle transport through the ceramic filters, right? And can answer some of the questions around what is, I mean, it's all this stuff I don't understand, very honestly, because I don't do the transport as much as I do a lot of this other work. But he's able to answer the question about why is the silver adsorbing to the ceramic or coming off? What influent water quality changes will make the silver come off? And what happens if you put chlorinated water through? What's the chemistry there? And this is incredibly scientific and engineering problems that then get applied. And so I often find like I'm, I have a problem and there's, I mean, we had an NGO send us a filter once, and they're like, it's not working. And I'm like, OK, cut it open, take pictures, whatever they do. And then I, I had this, I looked at the pictures they sent, and I'm like, I really remember ages ago in a class sometime, we talked about membrane fouling. And I think these membranes are fouled, and they're bursting. And I think that's the problem. So I called the membrane fouling specialist at Tufts, Isa. And Isa and I and the students wrote a paper together about membrane fouling in this type of filter. So it's about these connections and collaborations, and that's where the engineering comes in. And I'm sorry if that all wasn't clear, but the engineering is the 1%. If you're putting out hollow fiber membrane filters that foul when you expose them to certain types of water sources, you're not solving anybody's problems, right? We should put something else out. And so there's all kinds of really tough engineering questions that can inform these situations. That might have been a long answer, and I'm sorry about that, but I'm happy to. Yes? Provide to um, calling or into the uh, filter unit, do you charge for it? If you do, how does it like, charge? Well, so the yeah. normal shape of the yeah. 
So this is where I come in, and there, there's people who have incredible opinions about this. So the question is, do you charge for products or not? Generally, in humanitarian response, there's an ethos that you never charge for a product. Everything's handed out for free. In development, there's a huge debate. Jeff Sachs, Bill Gates, do you charge, do not charge? If you charge, do people value it more? I don't actually care. I've seen programs that work where they're handed out for free because people really need them. I've seen programs that work because they, they're charged a small amount, the whole amount, whatever. My sense is you need a cost-effective implementation strategy. So are you providing it for free? OK, great, but where's that money coming from, and how are you going to maintain that? Are you a rotary club that's working in a community, and you go back to the same community every year, and you bring money in? Fine, hand something out for free, right? It doesn't matter to me. But it's, to me, it's about humanitarian response. Almost everything is free. It's considered unethical to charge in humanitarian response when an outside actor is coming in. If you're selling within the community, I think it's different. But I think this is a debate that I've seen programs work all different directions. It depends on context. Does that make sense? OK. Other questions? OK, I'll go one, two, three. Eric. Uh, correlating uh, disease with poverty. Yeah. Are there statistics that correlate disease with the availability of family planning? Yes. So, so the question is the, the relationship of disease to family planning. And I think this comes at a larger question that I'm going to answer first, which is a lot of people, because I've heard this question a lot, is why are you trying to save these kids? Because they're just families that have too many kids and you should let them die because of overpopulation. People have said that to me. And I think what we see over and over and over again is when you allow families to choose how many children they have, when you have family planning, very rapidly it comes down to an average of two children per family, and your child health, your child death just evaporates. Like, it's family planning first, and then, because if you have to have kids to work the farm, or you have to have kids to take care of you in your old age, and 50% of them are dying, you have four to get two. Right? But if every child is surviving, or if most kids are surviving, you only have two. And when you keep kids alive, very rapidly it comes down to an average of two children per family. And so I think what we see is family planning is this incredible driver of, of child health, because then you have the resources to invest in each child. And some of the saddest stories I've seen, I've been in refugee camps where literally I was working with a, a we were surveying a household, and there was a, a young teenage mother, probably 14, 15, with a child. And that child was very noticeably ill on survey. As our ethics review board, we have to stop the survey. We have to provide medical care to that child. We brought it to the hospital with our vehicle. We found out that the family took that child out of the hospital that night because they wanted that child to die at home, because then it's not recorded, and they can keep the child's food ration. The child was worth more as a food ration than as an infant. And it is a very rational decision for a family that doesn't have enough food, and it's a heartbreaking decision to watch, right? And so I think that's what we need to think, is people are rational in these situations, right? But I consider it incredibly lucky that my children have always had enough food, and I don't know what I would do if they didn't, right? And so that's, that's my thoughts on family planning. Does that? Yeah, thanks. OK, up here. Can you go back to the the rats eating the tube? Oh, yeah. And what are the levels of management of that problem? So, so I can think of several possibilities, but I'd just like to hear. So the question is about companies that are putting out a product where they put it out in the field, and then the rats eat the tube or something goes wrong. I cannot tell you the debates and the fights and the pushback. My students will laugh because we're in the middle of one right now with companies that come to tell me, I have the perfect product. I've made it in my basement. I've tested it in my lab. I've designed it. It's perfect. I've done all the work. You just have to distribute it. I hear that all the time. And when I push back and I say, it's great. You have a prototype. Let's test it and find out what's wrong with it. And they're like, nothing's wrong with it. And I'm like, I guarantee there is something wrong with it. And they're like, no, 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 no. It's perfect. What I think we have to do, and this comes back to some of the, the design stuff that D-Lab does and that IDEO does, or in, there's so much in Boston that does this. We need to think about, about co-design. We have an idea. We have a prototype. You're investing. You're encouraging users 
in involving them in that decision. You're trialing it out with the intended users. You're seeing what goes wrong. You're going back to the design table. And you're doing this iterative design process in order to design a product. I helped design the dispenser. I did the engineering to design the dispenser. When I worked with the design firm on that, the first thing the design firm said was, tell me everything you have about your users. Send me everything you can, pictures, reports, information about the context, send me everything. They came back with five designs. They had a sleek design that would fit in your stainless steel kitchen. And at the other end of the spectrum, they had a design that looked like a pregnant woman, organic, right? Every person in the NGO working with dispensers, when I showed them the five designs, picked the sleek stainless steel kitchen one. We did focus groups in three countries. We asked what people like. We got their opinions. They said about the sleek stainless steel kitchen one, they're like robotic, scary, unapproachable, space-like. Pregnant woman was a bit much. The egg corn one, huggable, friendly. I overruled everybody, and the dispenser is the egg corn huggable. Does that make sense? And the, the NGO hated it. They were like, no, 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 we need this sleek design that looks good. And I'm like, no, 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 you need the design that isn't going to scare your users. Yeah, sorry. People might have mentioned I am passionate. Sorry. <laughs> and my driving, evidently. <laughs> OK, there was a third question right here. So um, you talked a lot about chlorination and yeah. microbial risks. And uh, kind of two questions. Yeah. Uh, one is, you have a lot of trouble getting people to accept chlorine in their water. Right. Yeah. And then the other one is you worry about other problems in the water. Exactly. Like contaminants, maybe pesticides right. or herbicides or other things in the water. So the so the questions are about chlorine and accepting taste. And then the, the other bit is about other contaminants, about beyond the microbes, like maybe the pesticides, the arsenic, the fluorides. So the, I'll do the second one first, which is essentially World Health is very clear. Address the microbial problems first, because that's going to be your immediate death in kids. If there's cholera in the water, you have to get rid of that first. And then after you have that addressed, then address your second. Like work with the arsenics, the fluorides, the pesticides. Because that's a, when you've solved the short-term risk, you have the luxury of looking at the longer-term risk. There's actually really interesting data from Bangladesh, which is juggling that. Do you have the diarrhea from the surface water or the arsenic from the well water? If you look just at numbers, and that's not how we can assess risk, you're probably better off drinking the arsenic water because less people will die of arsenic cancer than they will of diarrhea, right? But that's not how you work the risk. But these are kind of the trade-offs, right? So I would say my sense is first, the, the places we're working in, outbreaks, et cetera, we're looking at micro, we're looking at the immediate risk. But then when you solve that, you can move on to the others. About chlorine, I would say there is huge pushback on taste and on odor, and then also potential like cancer-causing agents. And, and people are people in emergencies are not, not smart. People know. And so people will bring up, like, what about trihalomethanes? What about hyaluacetic acids? And again, it's a short-term risk versus long-term risk. It's about, OK, what can we do now to get past the short-term risk, and then how do we address the longer term risk later. And then also there's a sense of in an emergency, people are more willing to do things they don't like. If cholera is happening, you drink the chlorinated water. But when the cholera is over, you may drop off. And you might want a longer term solution for normal background diarrhea. This may be more like a filter or something that's more acceptable. And so there's a difference. I think people's behavior and their risk perceptions vary quite a bit. And so I would say that's. It's not an easy answer, but these are all the kind of challenges. We have some research right now looking at chlorine taste and odor acceptance, like chlorine tablet acceptance. These are kind of the, the details of how to get things right and how do you balance all that out. It's a great question. Thank you. OK, are there other questions? Yeah, Pete. Can I add to this with the, the trade-off between the short term and the long term? What about the transition from an emergency Infrastructure is destroyed. How do you get back to normal? Right. So the question is, how do you do what it's called the relief to development continuum? And so the question is, you're, you have an emergency. You're in a relief mode. You're kind of doing whatever you can to 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 um, to to kind of fix the immediate problem. But then, how do you actually get to that development thing? And what I would say is, relief to development is the stated goal of every emergency response organization, and they never can have enough funding to do it. So what you'll see is an emergency response organization going in. They'll distribute aquatabs. They'll do whatever. And then they'll have an exit strategy, which is like hand out a filter and leave. 
Well, is that filter sustainable? Is it, what's happening? And I think if we really want relief to development, what we need is to hand over to government systems. So Peru is an amazing example of this. Peru, shining path, the war, terrible stuff for child health. And then the war ends, the government makes maternal and child health a priority, and within 10 years, within a decade, their metrics are amazing, right? And so is there good governance that can pick this up after the conflict or emergency is over? Or can you hand over to development organizations if there's not good governance? And that's where that project in Haiti with the buckets, like that was actually a development intervention scaled up in the emergency but kept going afterward. And so you can kind of see that transition happen. But I will say the vast majority of response is respond when all the money comes in, the $4 billion from people tweeting, blah, blah, blah. You respond, you do as much as you can, and then, and then what happens? Like what happens six months later? What, and there is a huge need to keep people alive, to give them food, water, shelter during that time. But I do think we do need a better job of that relief to development continuum. And there's a lot of discussion about that. Yeah, exactly. OK, so one, two. Uh, I'm an undergraduate and a student. And so looking at your presentation, it seems like a lot of what you do is bridging the gap between lots of disciplines. So yep. talking to people, working in policy and engineering, how do we learn how to become that? How do we be interdisciplinary engineers? That's, so the, the question is how do you become an interdisciplinary engineer? And how do you kind of get to this stage? And what I'll say, and, and it isn't the answer a lot of people want, is this is not the job you get your first job out of college. Right? This is a path. And this is a path that I think you see a lot of people walk. And the first step of that path, I would say, is get a skill. Become an engineer, become a doctor, become an accountant, become a nurse, become a midwife. Any of these things that give you a technical basis for your work. Right? I've seen amazing certified nurse midwives do amazing work on maternal mortality in Afghanistan. Right? Um, so get a skill first, and then there's get a job and learn how to apply those skills. I spent the first five years working on the Ipswich River Watershed Association applying like it's an NGO to, on water management in the Northeast Massachusetts. I learned everything. It was a two and a half person office. I talked to the press, I wrote grants, I managed volunteers. I learned a lot there. And then I went back to grad school and worked in Haiti with Pete and the MNG. And then I went back to, then I worked at CDC for eight years traveling 75% of my calendar days in over 40 countries. I presented directly to the Secretary General of the UN and I've worked with the little church group that goes to Haiti once a year in the technical expert that slice. And then after gaining all that experience, and very frankly, because I was a 35-year-old woman and had decisions to make, that's why I came back to academia, is because I can teach, have small children. I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old. It's all chaos. Um, and because now, like Pete said, everybody talked about how fearless I was and I travel. I don't travel anymore. I go to Berlin for a meeting. It's my graduate students that travel, right? And that's because I've chosen to have children. And that's a temporary time. I won't stay bound forever. But while they're small and while they're this, I'll, I won't travel. And then I don't know if I see myself in academia forever. I think maybe I'd go back. I see a lot of women when their kids are teenagers or grown, they go back into response. I could see myself being a cluster coordinator after my kids are grown. Does that make sense? But I think we all make decisions on our lives. But a lot of people ask, how do you become an interdisciplinary engineer? And it's you don't become one at 22 when you graduate from your undergrad. You have a, a work experience that builds over time. And you grab, there's stuff I've learned I would never have any idea because I've worked with people and I've had questions I wanted to answer. And it, it builds over time. And I would never have guessed I'd be here when I started. But you just have to take that first step. Does that make sense? Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, the, um, the water kiosks thing, uh, what picture is that again? So water kiosks are an interesting one, because 10 years ago, these didn't exist. But Indonesia, Haiti, Kenya, the, the slums, this is becoming the water supply in slums worldwide. And NGOs aren't doing anything. This is private sector. And the question is how to involve the government. So it's, it's not just Haiti, although the data I presented was Haiti. Yeah. How do you determine what an NGO from some external country is going to do um, versus something that an in-country private engineering firm or something? So 
ideally, before you do anything else, you do a needs assessment and a local assessment. If there's, I have not worked in most of South America because they don't need me, right? Because they have amazing engineers that know much more about the conditions, right? And so ideally, you would know it's about, OK, where, where are the gaps? Right? If you walk in and there's a ton of engineers that have a lot of water supply solution, you might not be needed except for funding, maybe. But if you walk in and it's a conflict area and the engineers have fled or been killed, then maybe there's a space. Right? And so the first thing should be what's available locally, who's available locally, what's being done, where are the gaps, and can I help fill those gaps? Right? And so there's a lot of countries. Like It was funny. I used to say all the time, I've never been to Zimbabwe. It one was one of the few countries in sub-Saharan Africa I was never in. I was like, I've never been to Zimbabwe because they don't need me because they have amazing water supply and sanitation infrastructure. And then the government and, and Mugabe, and I was working in Zimbabwe on the cholera outbreak because people fled. Because if you had an education, you went to South Africa. Right? And so that's, you, you got to think about, there's an ethics of working cross-culturally. And a lot of people, there's a quote, um, there's, a, there's a great article called The Seductive Reduction of Other People's Problems. Right? And so if we think about the opiate crisis in Kentucky, and uh, can we, sitting at MIT today, solve that opiate crisis in Kentucky? We'd be like, oh my god, that's, it's, it's, ter it's, it's entrenched poverty, it's racism, it's, it's not having enough jobs, it's coal, it's, it's access to drugs, it's doctors overprescribing, it's drugs coming in, it's fentanyl. We can label all of the things that make this an incredibly tough problem to solve, which is why we have an opiate crisis in, in Appalachia, right? But we think about, oh, yeah, Cameroon, that village needs water. Of course, that's an easy. That's a, oh, yeah, that's easy. Because you don't have the cultural context, and it's the seductive reduction of other people's problems. And we need to be really careful when we cross cultures to not reduce other people's problems because it's easy. We need to think about, OK, all of those complexities in the culture, and is there a place for us to help? Right? And that's the thinking. I always think, OK, when I fly, that's taking carbon. That's a plane ticket. It cost me $2,000 to get here. Would I have been better off donating that like, to a local organization? Is there a need for my skill set? Or conversely, and I think this is also good, a lot of people travel because it teaches people about the world. Like we see engineers at the borders, they go out, they learn what it's like in other places in the world, and they bring that back to their experience. That's also incredibly valuable that learning. But I think we need to be careful about not seductively reducing other people's problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. I probably have one more, and I'm super sorry. But yeah, do you want to be the last question? Oh, OK. Um, so uh, my question relates to ethics. And let's say you have somebody approach you that has the latest knowledge track, the latest and greatest idea yeah. for treating water. Yeah. Um, the human. Maybe there's some lab uh, data to support that it's actually back in the field, but the human factor is an absolute unknown. Um, how do you justify using that and applying that in the field when other more proven technologies have been shown to be more valuable? Like, how do you find the room for innovation in the engineering side? This is a question we struggle with in my lab group a lot. And we've actually we made an error on one when we distributed what we shouldn't have because it was too complicated. And we had some data that was, I think one thing is we've learned some lessons around we need to test the product independently on our lab when it gets there for efficacy and not just trust the company data. And we need to think about, like, is there actually a, a theory of change for why this might be better? Like the filter might be better because it doesn't taste of chlorine and people are willing to use it longer. And maybe if it has three steps, OK, it might be a little harder. But there's maybe a change that because the taste is better, people might do it. But if it has 15 steps, we really shouldn't be distributing it. And I think there's a little bit of, I think when we started doing this work in my group, we were less careful now than we are now because we've thought about this. And I think there is some pushback that needs to be given to the companies that are promising the world with their products. And we need to be thinking about, and so we're starting smaller, actually. Like, we're starting to do, like, thinking about doing, like, week long, give it to people for a day or two, get feedback, give this, um, pay them for that, like, having, a, like, you, we're hiring you for two days to use this, rather than immediately jumping to a six month trial or a year long trial, testing it in the lab first. We're thinking about, that. but these are the ethics, because there is room for innovation. We do need better products. Um, and sometimes those products can be more complex because they have other improvements, because the taste is better, or they treat the water better. But I think this is a space where, particularly in academia, we need to be ethically careful, where companies are often not ethically careful at all. I reviewed a 
proposals that had been given out by a donor where literally a company gave products to people in a low income context and made them sign a waiver that if they were harmed by the product, they wouldn't sue the company. Right? This was, I was reviewing what a donor had given. And I called the donor out. I'm like, this is unethical. And they're like, you can't write that in the report that we're funding unethical research. And I'm like, I'm doing that. But we've had this discussion in my own lab group. And I think this is really where we have to weigh the benefits and drawbacks, admit when we're wrong, and think about what type of study is ethical. Does that make sense? OK, thank you so much for having me.